Leave Anthony alone. Sorry. Yeah, but they're still scared of you. Yeah. Good to see everybody come out to the Lord's house tonight. Thank you for being here. Has anybody got a prayer request on your heart? Danny ain't here, so I'll fill in. Amen. Amen. Well, it runs in spells, don't it? Anyone else? Okay, remember that. Anyone else? Amen. Any others? All right. Let's also remember the Linda Ben's family. It's Maggie Bennett's sister-in-law. She passed away last night. So let's remember that family in their time of bereavement. Let's also remember our Bible study and the young people as they meet. The lost. This crazy country we live in that they'll get back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone else? Paul said that uh, to count it all joy when you suffer for Christ's sake. There's a battle for your mind. Uh, we've been through it. I've been through it. And it, uh, an ever-born-again Christian who steps out there for God, makes a difference, lives for him, doesn't sit in the background, but whether you preach or sing or teach or you just step out there and make yourself known that you love the Lord, the devil will battle for your mind. And so that's what you're going through. Anyone else? Amen. 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 Anyone else? All those have unspoken requests? Everyone that wills come to the altar will pray together.
Alex, you know Jacob? I was just beginning to like him, too. Jacob didn't. I didn't know it was coming in, but his grandma, Diane, and my wife were best friends forever and a day. All right, we are in Genesis chapter 3, picking up in verse number 16 tonight. And I'm going to put this on so Jerry can hear me. You remember we're beginning to pick up on the sinful nature. We looked at the sin nature in Lucifer, the devil, and how it motivated him to hate God's people, to come against God through God's people, and how the sin nature affected the marriage of Adam and Eve. And we're going to pick up now because the judgment of Christ brought a curse on Adam and Eve, and we're going to find out how it affected not only their marriage but their children. Because I've mentioned this before, but let me start this again. The sin nature will cause you to hate what you love the most. Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, the last part of that verse has really been misinterpreted over the years, has it not? Where the husband rules over the wife. But let's start at the first part of that verse. He begins to talk in strictly between the, the wife and the husband. Why is that? That God saw them separately when God judged them and pronounced his judgment and a curse on them. Why did God not go to them as a couple for just one judgment, why did each of them receive a separate judgment? That, and because nobody can make you sin, you're responsible for your own sin. You know, that whole thing with Flip Wilson, most of y'all younger people, you ain't got a clue. The devil made me do it? No, the devil makes you do nothing. He tempts you until you gain so much emotion, you do it yourself and then blame somebody else. That's what the sin nature does, doesn't it? Wasn't my fault. It was they made me do it. No, you do it yourself. But he begins to talk to Eve because who was the first one to sin? Eve was. But Adam sinned as well, did he not? So he takes Adam separate, but he gets to Adam. Nobody escapes God when you sin. (coughs) God knows everything, right? He says unto her, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Now let's just stop right there. What is so unusual about that? They understand somewhat about what sorrow means, don't they? Now they've got the sin nature. They're sorry for the sin, but it's too late. They've committed it. You can't take it back as if it never happened. So what was it that he begins to to judge them and talk to them separately? Each one, he explains their part in their sin, right? Number one, I'm going to tell you. Does the Bible not say that when a husband and wife get married, the two become one flesh? What did Eve do that was so an egregious of a sin that it, God separates them in judgment. She acted alone outside of her husband. Did she not? Did he tell her, to, did, did Adam say sin or not sin? Adam was, was there, but he, had no, he, he was silent. Did the devil make her sin? Okay, she acted independently of Adam was did God not put Adam as the head of the marriage as the leader of the home well he didn't do his job for one thing but by the time we get to the conversation that the devil had with him Eve was already acting separately from Adam she was acting on her own and when you have husband and wife and you don't act as one and you don't talk things out and you don't agree with things and you don't have a good partnership You've got chaos in the marriage. 
If the husband does his own thing the way he wants to and she does her own thing the way she wants to and you meet up every once in a while, you've got chaos in your marriage. That's why you've got to have a partnership and a fellowship and a friendship. You can't live two people become one, live in the same house, and everybody just do what they want to, and it don't matter what the other spouse thinks about it. You've already lost the marriage at that point. And so Eve acted independently of Adam. And here's the thing, there was no distractions in the garden except for the devil and the serpent. And until he started talking, there was no distraction. Do you not agree we live in a world where it's just chaotic and there's distractions on every hand? You've got work, you've got family, you've got friends, you've got this, that, and the other. And they're constantly, something wants the wife's attention, something else wants the husband's attention. There's always something trying to draw you into it away from each other. Adam and Eve had no chaos. It was the two of them and the animals. But... At the first opportunity, the devil had already looked at that marriage. And don't think the devil won't look at your marriage and figure out the weak spot and try to figure out how to separate you. You might still be married. You might still be in the same house. But you can live two separate lives and still be married. Is there peace in that? So do you see when God said, I'm going to greatly multiply thy sorrow, she had something to go on. They felt sorrow about their sin, but God's taking it into a whole new direction that they don't know anything about. He said, I'll multiply. Notice what God says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in conception. Well, we're all grown-ups. We know what conception is, don't we? For all those who in here who have given birth, You get the greatest high, don't you, when the doctor says you're pregnant. Don't stay that way through the nine months, though, does it? You get sick. You worry. And don't it seem like that baby wants to lay their head on your bladder for the whole nine months? My wife, for both of her pregnancies, we couldn't go on a road that had a curve in it. She'd be the window down, be hanging out there like a drunk, just puking everywhere. Tried to go to Jellicoe to see my grandma, and we couldn't ever get there. There's always something. You swell up, you feel bad, your body turns against you. Is that not from the greatest experience given childbirth, being becoming a mom, but is that not some of the greatest fear, worry, and sorrow that you go through? You been through it, Jeff? I got you, buddy. Three for you, two for me. And so now, why is that conception and why does childbearing seem so odd in this conversation? I don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in the garden before they sinned, right? But I believe in the day-age theory. That's when I believe God created everything grown up. I believe every animal... Every tree, every plant, everything in this world didn't, it wasn't a seedling. It took years to grow and form and harvest. They had to eat. So unless they lived long enough for some of the animals to conceive and have little ones come along, they had no idea what childbirth or given birth even existed because they were created. Neither one of them ever grew up. They came into being with their first breath, grown up man and woman. So when God begins to tell her he's going to greatly multiply their sorrow and conceptions, she had no idea unless they witnessed the birth of some animals. And it could have happened. So you had to say that God was taking her somewhere that she didn't really understand as far as judgment goes, right? But God, when God himself says, I'm going to be the one that greatly multiplies your soul, what he's telling her is this. It ain't going to just going to be one problem. And for the ladies in here that's given birth, you know you don't just have one problem during pregnancy, do you? It comes in multitudes of things that could happen. And I don't even want to go down that road on the possibilities. But you understand, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. 
Well, that had to be a whole new concept. They'd never seen a child. They had nothing to go on. They're the only two people in the whole entire world at that time. Their whole world consisted of Eden. So they knew nothing about being a mom, a dad. They really messed up husband and wife. So now God says, I'm going to multiply your sorrow in your conception. So now she had to worry about what's conception and what kind of sorrows is God talking about. But then in childbearing. So do you understand what kind of a fear she may have had and God's telling her all these bad things? On top of that, they had the guilt of sinning against God on top of all that. Have you ever noticed that sometimes trouble comes to you in truckloads? It don't just show one little problem in a day's time. Sometimes it just comes and the next truck comes and the next problem comes and it's over and over. And they just try to pile something on top of you. You're going to have days like that. But notice he says this, thou shalt bring forth children. And then God changes the whole concept in their relationship. Notice what he said before they sinned. Was it not their prerogative, if you will, but was it not their desire to please God? But when they sinned against God, God said you couldn't do that. It's all changed. Do you not believe, and I'm going to prove it from the Bible, do you not believe that you can make one decision somewhere young in your life and it follows you all the days of your life? And maybe follows your kids. They used to call that generational curses. But notice, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. If you left that verse alone, every man would just be puffing his chest out right about now, wouldn't he? And every wife would be looking at it and say, don't you even think about it, buddy. It ain't going to work at this house. Am I right? Because I've seen husband and wives look at each other, all both of you. Boy, I wish Brian was in here so you could give him the stink eye. <laughs> he's hearing it. He's, he's watching it. Sorry, Brian. Notice that he shall rule over you. Was it not God? Did God not give Adam a head over Eve at their beginning when he joined them together? Let me ask you a question. Did he do his job as head of that family when they were standing at the tree talking with the devil? then why in the world would God ever tell Eve, your desire is no longer to please God, your desire is to please your husband? And how many also know old time, it ain't as bad as it is now as it used to be, but old time, I've seen it with my own eyes, men in the church would take that verse and a two or three more with it and rule their wives. It used to be that way, did it not? Notice verse number 17. And Adam, it's his turn now. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Stopping right there. Whose voice should Adam have listened to first always? Let me just throw this out there since, it's up, since I'm up here with it. The Bible does teach us the husband's head of the house, right? But that's in responsibility too. That ain't just being the boss. But with that being said, does a husband have a right to tell a godly wife, let's just say the husband ain't saved. Let's go with that for this one. I'm going out Friday night, we're going honky-tonking, and I want you to go out with me, and we're going to drink and dance. You're a saved wife. You're a saved woman. Now, whose voice do you listen to now? Do you listen to the voice of your husband, or do you listen to the voice of God? So do you understand you can't take that statement and say, you've got to listen to that man for everything that he says? Nobody has the right to tell their spouse to, com to convince them to commit sin when they know better. 
Do I need to say it again? And that goes for the other. Sometimes you got a saved husband and an ungodly wife, and she's trying to get you in a mess you know ain't right. Do you listen to keep peace to her voice, or do you hear the voice of God? So do you understand sometimes that the voice of God will bring division between a husband and wife that have become one flesh? And God's ex- given an example of that right now, is he not? Eve took the apple, Eve ate the apple, or it might not be an apple, but the fruit, gave it to Adam, he ate. He should have listened to the voice of God and said, now wait a minute, woman. God said specifically, don't eat of that tree. Let's leave that alone. And he should have stopped her before she did. But then again, once he saw what she had done, there's no turning back. He still should have listened to the voice of God and not listened to the voice of his woman because what is God chastising him for? Thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, not the voice of God. So do you understand the possibilities when you have an unequally yoked household, one loves and serves God, not just say, but serves God, the other one don't. Do you see how it does create problems? The lost spouse will resent everything you do for God. And if they ever get to where they don't say nothing, then they just begin to pull away and pull away and pull away and pull away until you're just two people that don't seem to care. I've seen that a lot. Do you understand why the Bible says don't be unequally yoked? But notice it says... You've hearkened to the voice of your wife, but notice the voice of your wife, what, it, what he did by listening to her voice and not God's. And has eaten of the tree, which notice God says, I commanded thee. So how much plainer can you get when God told Adam, and notice there were two trees. It was one was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? God didn't mention at that time, don't eat from the tree of life. But the tree of life existed. Those were the two trees they couldn't eat off of. But they had no desire to eat off the tree of life. Do you want to know why that is? Because before they sinned, they were intended to live forever in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were never to die until they disobeyed God and brought the sin nature inside of them. But we'll see where God deals with that here in a few minutes. He said, and cursed is the ground for thy sake. Notice now he begins to give Adam his sorrows. Thou shalt eat of it. Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. What is the word sorrow, the definition for how the word sorrow is is in this one? For him and Eve both. It means moral worthlessness. You see, sorrow comes in a lot of different definitions. Were either one of them morally competent to God when they disobeyed God? Are we morally competent to God when we disobey God? So you understand. God says you're no longer moral. So for us that are not moral, we're born immoral are we not we only become moral through God and salvation and the Holy Spirit so now Adam's curse is this what did God place Adam in the garden to do take care of it he says tend it what does that mean that mean you want to eat something God planted it you just take care of it Because we all know living here in the South, you can't plant a garden unless you tend it or you won't have a garden. We don't tend the weeds, do we? We don't tend the mountains. We only tend the garden. And that's what he told Adam to do, tend that garden. Take care of it. Well, guess what? Adam's role has not changed. He's still going to have to tend a garden, is he not? They got to eat. Up until later on, we'll get to that some other time, up until later on, you don't find that they ever killed anything, 
that they ever cooked anything. Thank you. If I had a gold star girl, you'd have it. But I don't. Notice that he says, Thou shalt eat of it, but notice how he ends that verse. All the days of thy life. Which means, which means the judgment on you will never run out as long as you're alive. And Adam lived several hundred years. Have y'all ever kept a garden? Has anybody ever grew up on a farm where you actually grew most everything? Know what I'm talking about? You familiar with it? Is it not a hard life? Does it not depend on you working six days a week and depending upon the grace of God, the weather, the weeds, the bugs, the hailstorms, the wind, the rain, the weather... There's a lot of moving parts into growing a garden successfully where it does you throughout the year, right? Yep. And just taking care of your livestock. They got to eat too. They got to have hay. They got to have corn. They got to have different things. All of it depends. Now, you see, Adam never had a problem. We're going to find out Adam never had a problem in the garden because God, there was no curse on it. There was no sorrow in it. Verse 18. Here, here he begins to break it down to Adam in a way that he doesn't fully understand because he's never dealt with it. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Notice the competition. What is the problem, one of the, one of the biggest problems growing a garden that you have? You got to chop the weeds. Not only you got to depend upon the weather and good seed and good ground, you got to get the weeds because weeds don't need help. You've got to chop them and get them out of the way because they take away from it. And if you don't, you won't have anything to eat. So now, instead of just going out and just tending the garden without thorns and thistles and weeds and all that, where it was, you know, we all wish we could grow a garden like that, don't we, Kathy? Now you got to compete with the thorns and the thistles and the weeds and the bugs and all that stuff that we all deal with. And that's not changed. So God has got him still farming, but now he's in competition. That means you're going to have to put a whole lot more work into it, but you're going to harvest much less. Verse 19, here's something we all know something about. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return to the ground. Okay, let me ask you a question. How does he get bread? Is there anything the Bible ever says about eating bread in the garden? So in order to get bread, which is something they're now going to desire, there's a lot of steps to that, is there not? Flour, wheat, baking bread, and bread's a staple and has been since right here. But now you see the introduction to bread to their diet. But he says it's in the sweat. And if you've ever raised a garden, we raise a garden in the hottest part of the year, don't we? You can't work a garden without sweating and the bugs. And God help them pack saddles. Grandpa was a tobacco farmer. I was his free labor. I was the oldest of us three carrying kids. I was a little fellow and I could plow a team of mules. And I wasn't as big then as I am now. But I was something else sitting up on that plow with them mules. They listened to me only because they knew Grandpa would take a two before to them if they didn't. They wasn't scared of me. But then I learned about what kind of work that it goes in when you grow your own food. Because trust me, not everybody had the money to go to the grocery store and buy everything they wanted. And if my grandpa had the money, he still wouldn't do it because he had been raised to farm. 
in the sweat of thy face, which means it's going to be excessive labor, till thou returnest unto the ground. That's a brand new one because here's what God said, for out of it thou was taken. How much do you think God shared with Adam about his creation? Do you think God shared that to Adam before you ever existed? I came down, the Trinity did, we took the dust of the ground, we formed you, and then I breathed the breath of life into you. That's how you got here. Do you think they ever had that conversation? But do you think they never had this conversation because it never came up? There was no reason for it. Adam, you came out of the ground and you're going back to the ground, which means when I said you were going to die if you eat that tree, you're really going to die. It didn't happen instantly. It happened instantly spiritually, but physically it's going to happen. Nobody was supposed to die until Adam sinned and Eve. And notice he said this, Out of it thou was taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt thou 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 shalt return Genesis I don't go there I'm just going to read it out loud Genesis 2:17 but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die is that not the direct conversation God had with Adam now, what God said was true and what the devil said was a lie, correct? So that conversation had to come back into Adam's mind. I told you about this. Which is why I say this. Most of the sin that grown-ups commit, we do so willingly because we, and knowingly because we know it's a sin before we do it, right? Is there a penalty for it? Is it fair when you knowingly and willingly commit a sin and judgment falls on you to start whining to people about how bad things are? You ever heard those saying, you brought it on yourself? Is there truth to that? Do you think Adam, if he was sitting right yonder, he'd throw that little hand up there and say, Brother Preacher Bobby, you're right. Let me tell you about it. And don't raise your hand, but how many grown-ups in this church right now have been through that? And you thought you could get away with it, or you just didn't care, or God help, most of the time we sin, it's because we're mad. And we just don't care what anybody says. But when you cool down, I wish I hadn't done that. Look at verse number 20. Now, did God not already tell Eve in verse 16 she was going to bring children into this world? Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living, even though she had not given birth to anything yet. Up until this time, had he really named her? She was but woman, wasn't we? The woman, the woman, the woman. Now she's got a name the mother of all living. Well, just because it hadn't happened, if God says it's going to happen, it's take it to the bank. She has no idea about being a mother. She has no idea about pregnancy and childbirth. She's about to learn. And she is about to learn the hard way what sorrow actually feels like. Verse 22, no, verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? Now, you know God ain't got a print, or got, ain't got one of these, whatever you call them, where you make your own clothes. Something had to die, did it not? Could God not have clothed them with big leaves? Could God not have clothed them some other way? Could he not have tied moss around them? Could God have come up with something other than something having to shed blood and die, if he chose to. Do you know why he did that? Number one, God said that the life is in the blood. He's always required a blood sacrifice, which is why we're going to see why him and Cain fell out. But it required something to die, something to sacrifice, something to shed their blood, 
to give them clothing because guess what? Now they know they're naked and they're living in shame. And it all started out with just one sin, didn't it? Do you understand, depending upon what the sin is and, and how it all came, do you all understand how one sin can change the, not just your life but the life of your family and people around you? Sin nature, right? Remember the first thing Adam did after inheriting the sin nature when God said, did you to that tree, Adam? First thing he said was, the woman you gave me, if you had just given me somebody different, if you'd have just given me somebody better, Lord, it wouldn't have worked out this way. And I say, Adam, if you'd have been doing your job as a husband following the leadership of Almighty God, she wouldn't have never had the opportunity. If nothing else, could he not have built a fence around that to keep her away from it? It's the equivalent if you got a spending problem cutting up your credit card. Not that anybody here does. I wasn't insinuating. Verse 22. And the Lord God said, now he's having a conversation with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Because notice what he says. The man has become as one of us. You can't have us without having more than one. When you heard that before, it was when they decided to make Adam, let's make him in our likeness and our image. So now you've got the same Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and now we've got a problem. They can't stay here. And you know why they can't, right? Why, Alex? Amen. Amen. Could God in good conscience allow somebody to live in a sinful nature for eternity? He can't look upon sin. He could never have fellowship with them again. (coughs) Notice, the the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. How blessed do you think they realized they were before this happened to know nothing but good? How many of y'all's ever seen, heard, know, or experienced something you wish you'd have never went through in your life and hope you never have to again? That's exactly what God's talking about. Until you ate of that tree and you knew the difference, all you knew was good. Boy, wouldn't that be great? Isn't that like a child, though? They're just little. They don't know anything bad, do they, when they're first born? It usually shows up about the time they've got their favorite toy and another kid shows up. Then it's on. Notice he says, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand. And notice this tree was not told to Adam previously to not eat of because there was no need from it, but now that he knows good and evil... And he eyeballs that tree of life, and God's done said you're going to die, and God's done said you're going to have all kinds of sorrow. Honey, I think we need to go ahead to that tree of life because we're going to die if we don't eat. Do you understand how the sin nature will come up with this way, this way, this way, this way to try to find loopholes to get you out of some type of judgment? People will spend more time figuring out how to commit a crime without getting caught than try to do what's right. They'll spend time figuring out how I can hoodoo somebody out of something instead of just working for it. He said, let's see days take, also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God couldn't have that, could he? So what does he do? Verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now he has to compete. How hard do you think that was on God to send the only two children 
that were his out into a sin-cursed world because what you got to understand, the world was under a curse. The Garden of Eden was a sanctuary, but the rest of the world, rest of the world was under a curse because the devil was in it. So now he's sending them out there. It's the equivalent of this. We've got kids raised up in church, raised up in Campbell County. We ain't a perfect county, but we're not Chicago, L.A., or New York, are we? Take your 18-year-old kid, put him on a bus, heart of New York City, set him out. Could a parent, after being raised here and never seeing the things that goes on in the big city, could you imagine what you would be placing your children into by doing that to them? They ain't ready for it, are they? You've got two that all they ever knew was good, good, and good until they sinned. Now, do you think the devil's going to be there to hold their hand and help them through this time? No. He already accomplished what he wanted to do. He left. So now God, knowing what's out there, has to send the only two kids he has at that time out into a sin-cursed world. He sent them right downtown Chicago and L.A. And the reason I know that kids raised up here and raised up in church their own life, my daughter went to New York City with a, that uh, choir she sung with. She called home every night and said, Dad, you ain't going to believe what I've seen today. I ain't going to tell you what it is, but I want to tell you she saw the sinful side of the streets of New York. She'd never seen that type of stuff in Campbell County. So when y'all start finding fault with Campbell County, go spend a month in New York. Amen. Yep. See if you ain't going to rush back here and just kiss the ground. So now God's sending his children out into a new a city, and I hope there ain't nobody from New York on Facebook right now. Oh, sorry. I love you, but your city is what it is. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Notice that he was taken from dust, He's got to plow and work the dust. And then when he gets buried, he's going back to dust. Verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So if there was a gate... There was probably a fence there, don't you think? Really no need to put up a gate unless there's a fence. They just walk around it. But he put cherubims for as long as it existed to keep them from coming back in because what do you think the first thing they'd want to do was when they seen what that reality was like? I'm going back. They would have done what they did and they would have tried to sneak back in and stay away from God as much as they could. And That's pretty rough out here. We got folks that think Knoxville's rough. Go to L.A. Go to Gary, Indiana. It's a lot closer but just as bad. Go to any large city in the United States and you're going to see a whole different world than what you're used to here. Look at verse number four. I want to get into the sinful nature as it is inherited. Did Adam and Eve inherit the sinful nature or did they invite it? Look at verse number one in chapter number four. Adam knew his wife. I know there was something I was supposed to read, and I can't remember what. Yeah, before you get that, something I wanted to deal with. Scott, can you put, go back to verse number 16 in Genesis 3. 
Can you put in up First Timothy chapter two and verse number fourteen? And it will magically appear any minute. Do what? First Timothy chapter two, verse fourteen. Notice what the what he says. This is the Apostle Paul. If you don't think the Bible is true, every word of it, this happened in Genesis. Moses wrote about it. Thousands of years later, the Apostle Paul is writing a book covering the same event, is he not? Adam was not deceived. Do you understand why the judgment of God fell on him the way that it did? Because Adam did this with his eyes wide open. He did it because he loved Eve. He didn't want to be separated from her. He listened to her voice. And ain't that what God said the reason he was judging Adam? Because he hearkened unto the voice of his wife. And he said, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. The devil really deceived her. He was clever. So you understand the sin that was committed in the Garden of Eden still follows humanity today into the New Testament church. And you want to know why we're never going to get rid of it before the rapture takes place? Because everybody that's born inherits a sinful nature. You can't help it. Thank you, Scott. Let's go to chapter 4 in Genesis, verse 1. <coughs> And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Did God not say she would conceive? All right, since we're all adults, we're married, we know what Adam knew his wife meant, right? Never took place in the Garden of Eden as long as they were innocent. And the very second that they were no longer innocent, then they were ashamed. Now, God fully intended for them to populate the, have children but just not at that time notice what she says she can see because God said she was going to right but notice what she said I have gotten what a man from the Lord number one it's a boy before everybody got as confused as they are with gender people knew the difference between boys and girls Scott, could you please put 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12 up there, please? And this will be the last one we do. Notice she says, I've gotten a man from the Lord, right? Keep that in your head. All right, Scott, 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. What does the writer of John, what does he say about Cain? Not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Who, who is the wicked one? The devil. Eve just said she got a man from the Lord, right? John the writer of John Revelation, he just got through saying Cain wasn't of that. He was of the wicked one. Ain't that what the book says? Amen. You ain't got Bobby's opinion on this. Who's right? What does it all mean? It, we're going to see it word for word here in, as we study chapter 4. But just right off the top, what do y'all think? She says I got a man from God. John says he was the wicked one, which is the devil. Y'all don't want to explain it? It'll get it is self-explanatory when we go through chapter 4, but let me just go ahead and get, give it this way. He's the first human born 
into this world born with a sinful nature. Right? Cain is the second born, correct? He's born with a sinful nature. That does not mean, and I've heard this said many times over the years, that does not mean that the devil was his daddy. Adam was his daddy. The devil's a spirit creature. So how is Cain of the wicked one? I'll go ahead and jump a few verses ahead. Did God not tell him, as long as you do well, you're going to be good? But when you do wicked or you, when you do evil, sin lies at the door. Which means you've got the sinful nature just like I do. And have you ever wondered why some people are just so bent to go down that path and stay on that path their entire life? You let them out, they're right back into it because that's what they choose. Or you can choose to follow God, right? you got two choices. The first human being ever born with a sinful nature decided he was going to follow his sinful nature. Because we're going to find that he has hate, he has anger. God, the day before that he killed his own brother out of a fit of rage, God came to his tent and said, boy, you got a problem. Now, you can do evil and sin life at the door. And the, what he's trying to say is that the devil's got a demon, and that demon is a sinful nature, and you're going to act on your sinful nature full of hate. Or you're going to turn your life around and follow me just like your brother does, because it ain't like Cain didn't have an example. He had a brother that was a godly man. And here's something you see in the Bible quite a bit, and not only that, but you see it out into this world. You've got the wicked that rise up and overcome the godly. How many people are killed and throughout the thousands of years were killed for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's happened in this United States. That, uh, what was the name of that school? It wasn't Stony Fork. Is that one a bunch of years ago? Sandy Hook. Did them two demon-possessed boys not ask those kids individually, do you love Jesus? Yes, I do. Pop. So it happens in this country. It's not just in China. It's not just in Iran. It's not just in the Muslim countries. It is right here that hate will rise up and kill the godly. Who are the most persecuted people in America today? It's the white evangelical Christians. And it's also black Christians. Brown Christians. Any Christians. But who does the media blame for every time a, a conservative gets elected to a position? You know what they claim about Trump? We're deplorables and we're a bunch of cultists. White evangelical America. And all I believe this is that book. So do you understand how the sin nature governs people to see things through the filter of a sinful nature and not how they really are? Does the church actually force anybody to believe? But the Muslim do, don't they? They will kill you if you don't. We just say you're going to hell. And we want you to go to heaven. But we're the ones in this country that are persecuted for our personal beliefs. Amen. That's because the sinful nature, you can either follow the sinful nature in you, you can follow the Holy Spirit in you. So, verse number one. She conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Do you not suppose that's how it started out? Do you not suppose that God gave the gift? Because the children come from God, right? But what John is saying, Cain had the same opportunities, had the same mom and dad, had the same God they offered sacrifice to, had the same opportunity that Abel had. He just chose to go with his sinful nature. 
Is that not what his mama did? Did she not choose to listen to the voice of the devil, the serpent, disobey the voice of her husband and God? Is that not a sin that we're still paying for today? I know, don't get, don't throw at me. I know God paid that sin debt at Calvary. I ain't saying that. We're still living under the penalty of that sin that they committed in the garden. That's a better way to put it. All right, that's about all we're going to have time for tonight. Has anybody got any questions? Because in verse 2, she has another baby. Cain tilled the ground, did he not? Ain't that what his daddy did? Was a tiller of the ground. Y'all still pay y'all still paying attention to me? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir. That's the first. <laughs> Thank you. That felt good. <laughs> Amen. Anybody got any questions? What we'll probably study and finish this up next week is I want you to see how the sinful nature affects humanity from birth because Cain and Abel were the first true that were born with the sinful nature inside of them and you're going to see how it affected the family how it affected them as individuals because understand when they're children it's all about the family but once you get up to that certain age of accountability it becomes to be about you you begin to stand alone for the decisions you make all right, no questions? Right here. Let me show you what I've been looking at. Good to have Jacob with us tonight, ain't it? I appreciate him being with us. God bless you, buddy. You come back anytime you want. All right, then, before I make somebody mad, everybody stand to your feet. Let's dismiss.